think I think we uh, we start. So I would like to welcome all of you uh, and thank you for our speakers uh, for being with us today. Uh, uh, welcome to the webinar on tobacco industry tactics which is a part of uh, the European Conference on Tobacco Control. So as a uh, brief on, on ENSP, the European Network uh, for Smoking and Tobacco Prevention, for because we have a new uh, participant, maybe they are not uh, uh, aware about the ENSP work or about ENSP in general. So ENSP is an international organization based on Brussels, uh, active for more than 20 years, in field of tobacco control with more than uh, 60 full members, including national coalitions uh, present in uh, 34 European countries. So the mission of the ENSP uh, is to develop strategy for uh, coordinated action among organizations active in tobacco control in Europe by sharing information and experience and through coordinated activities and joint projects. So today's uh, webinar, as I mentioned, on tobacco industry tactics. Uh, as we know all, uh, uh, most of us, the, the uh, new uh, global tobacco index, uh, very two interesting uh, maps about the least in the world and the countries with most interference from tobacco industry uh, in the world. Uh, as we know that tobacco industry, which is uh, responsible for more than 8 million deaths annually worldwide, uh, has never taken responsibility for the diseases and deaths as uh, products have caused and continue to cause in customers, governments, and society. So also, uh, in this period, this time, this year, all, all suffering from uh, COVID-19 pandemic. So tobacco industry is exploiting the 2020 COVID-19 pandemic to provide resources to countries badly in need uh, of them, uh, framing itself as being part of the solution, a classic tactic of tobacco industry to get close to governments and in it to interfere uh, with uh, derail and undermine health policies aimed at reducing tobacco use. The tobacco industry also exploited the pandemic to engage with governments to an extraordinary level with government receipt and endorsement of charitable uh, contributions, being the industry's key avenue to access senior officials, including several uh, instances of the industry involving. Uh, the Prime Minister's office and several uh, countries. Even as more countries adopt comprehensive tobacco control, the tobacco industry is working to undermine uh, the government efforts in order to hook new users and push new products. Uh, also, we all know that uh, Philip Morris tried very hard uh, uh, to uh, where lobbying uh, campaign to undermine the tobacco uh, product directive. So we have Article 5.3 of the FCTC guideline recommended recommend governments ensure transparency by requiring periodic uh, disclosure uh, from the tobacco industry about its activities and uh, practices. Uh, when uh, procedures to obtain such information are in place, and the information can guide officials in preventing tobacco industry interference. Article 5.3 guidelines provide a range of preventive actions uh, governments can take to protect their tobacco control policies from being uh, subjected by commercial and vested interest. Uh, uh, governments can halt tobacco industry interference. The quicker governments act to implement the recommendations in Article 5.3 uh, guidelines, the better protected they will be to advance their tobacco control uh, policies. Uh, of course, tobacco industry will not stop interfering. Civil society can expose and countries' industry interference 
uh, but it is in the hand of governments to halt it uh, altogether. So uh, we all know about uh, the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, they are 17, but the tobacco industry work, interference, uh, business affect uh, and we can see the, uh, it's violence for many uh, SDGs. Last webinar, when we mentioned uh, about uh, illicit tobacco trade uh, protocol, uh, it was also violation for violence for some uh, uh, SDGs. And in general, tobacco industry can affect the SDG 1, 3, 5, 8, 10, 13, and 15 with their businesses, with their interference with, with, uh, with governments. Uh, so, uh, we, today we uh, will talk about many topics, many experience from the world. Uh, as we know, tobacco taxation is an effective policy to decrease uh, tobacco consumption and increase revenue. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Konstantin Krasovsky will talk about tobacco industry response to tobacco tax hikes. The case of Monte uh, Negro. Uh, Dr. Constantine, uh, in 1995 to 2000, Director, Alcohol and Drug Information Center, Kiev, Ukraine. In 2009 to 2017, he worked as a head of tobacco control unit in the Institute of the Ministry of Health. 2000, 2014 to uh, 2019, he was a World Bank consultant on tobacco taxation, and he published about 50 works on tobacco control issues in 2003 he was awarded by the world health organization award on recognition of outstanding contribution to tobacco control before dr constantine to start i just would like to remind you that uh, dear participants any questions please you can uh, write it down on the question and answers or on the chat uh, boxes uh, dr constantine the floor is yours please Okay, sorry, do you hear me? Yes, Constantine, I can hear you. Yes, and uh, can everybody see my slides? No, still not. Yes, I, I start. So everybody in tobacco control knows that tobacco tax increase Const is- a Constantine, can you, sorry to interrupt, can you try to share your slides? It's, uh, I've sent my slides, so is it, uh, it's, it's somewhere in the secretariat. So I'm uh, start my speech before okay. they uh, sorry, find sorry. The, sorry. The, the slides. Mm -hmm. So everybody in tobacco control knows that tobacco tax increase is a win-win policy. Tobacco consumption decreases and tobacco revenue increases. So why most governments do not increase tobacco taxes? In some cases, like in Georgia in 2006 or in Pakistan in 2017, the rates were even reduced. In all such cases, the tobacco industry used similar tactics to change the taxation policy. The most recent example is small country, Montenegro. Uh, and now I need my slides. So it just, okay, before it's, it's explained that um, Montenegro is a very small country. The population is less than 1 million. They even don't use, have their own currency. They use euros and uh, they do not have uh, cigarette production last year's only uh, uh, import and re-export. Okay, so it's my slides. Okay, uh, next slides, please. So, some history. Tobacco excise hikes undertaken in Montenegro in 2009-2011 were successful in both fiscal and public health terms. And uh, uh, revenue from excise rose from 13 million to 44 million euros. And annual cigarette sales declined from 1.5 billion cigarettes to less than 1 billion. So, successful policy, but 
uh, next five years, tobacco excise increases were too small to reduce tobacco sales and tobacco revenues did not change much. But uh, on my graph, have a look on um, figures of 2017-2018. It's some increase in 2017 and sharp decline in 2018 because it's a key for our story. Next slide, please. In July 2017, Montenegro adopted an ambitious plan of tobacco excise increases from August 2017, January 2018, and January 2019. But in uh, uh, early uh, 2018, the tobacco excise revenue declined. And from September 2018, the tobacco excise rates were reduced. Uh, so it's um, it first plans that specific excise tax would be 50 euros in 2019, but actually it was only 30 euros. And of course, tobacco industry was behind this reduction. Next slide. Next slide, please. Japan Tobacco International claims that losses in excise revenue in Montenegro were caused by an aggressive increase in excise and the growth of the legal trade. In order to stop the growth of the black market, it's necessary to revise the excise calendar. However, the revenue decline was a tobacco industry response to the tax hikes adopted in July 2017. The industry developed and implemented the plan, which eventually persuaded the government to reduce the excise tax. The plan had the following elements. First, forest telling. Second, cigarette smuggling overestimated. Third, price overshifting. The intended result of this action was a temporary tobacco excise revenue reduction. Next slide. So what is forest telling? The guidelines of FCTC states that in anticipation of uh, tax increases, manufacturers or importers may attempt to take advantage of the current lower tax and increase production or stock of products, and it's known as forest telling. Specific excise uh, was increased in August 2017 by 6 euros in Montenegro and then uh, by 10 euros more in January. The industry increased the cigarette supply in late 2017, especially in July and December, to pay lower taxes and then to keep the tax cigarettes in stocks and to sell them in retail about the tax increase. How we get to know it? You see, it's uh, actually data on cigarette sales in Montenegro are not available but we have monthly data on import and export in monetary terms. As cigarettes are not produced in Montenegro, such trade balance actually show amount of tax cigarettes and this figure is presented on my graph on this slide. In the second half of 2017, the net balance, so the difference between import and export of cigarette waste was 8.2 million euros, including 2.5 billion in July before the first tax increase, which was 25% higher than in the first half of the year and 33% higher than in the second half of previous year. But in the first uh, half of 2018, the balance decreased to 2.6 million, only one third of the second half of 2017. You see, sharp uh, decrease of supply. Next slide, please. And uh, because of forest telling, the excise revenue in September, December 2017 were 54% higher than in January, April 2017, while the average uh, excise increased only by 26%. So in 2017, the government got more revenue than expected. But if they got more revenue in 2017, it means that it gets less in 2018. And it did happen. In January, April 2017, okay, it's lost. Uh, uh, in January, April 2018, the revenue was half of September, uh, December 2017, uh, at cigarette trade decreased threefold. The industry claimed that huge smuggling caused the revenue downfall in promise that after the excise rate reduction, effective from September 2018, the revenue would be much higher, but actually it was not the case. You can see on the graph that in January, April 2018, the revenue was almost the same as 2018, while the excise tax was reduced. It means the cigarette sales did increase, but revenue didn't. 
So tobacco industry lie as usual. Uh, next slide. Cigarette smuggling overestimated. In early 2018, you see, I've read uh, Montenegrin newspapers. Uh, the tobacco industry encouraged media campaign in Montenegro with claim regarding of huge increase in cigarette smuggling due to the excise tax increase. However, the excise rates was first increased in August. But in the second half of 2017, the tobacco trade balance grew. Only from January 2018, the so-called smugglers eventually understood that the price difference between licit and delicit cigarettes became high enough and presumably increase the illegal sales. And poor legal importers had to decrease their sales. In September 2018, the excise rate was reduced and most of the assumed smugglers similarly stopped the activities. And in the second half of 2018, the legal cigarette trade balance was 5.6 euros. You can see the graph on previous slides, which was almost the same as in late 2016. In early 2018, the illicit cigarette tax, according to media report, was as low as 0.6 euros, while the cheapest legal brands was much more expensive, 2.2 euros. The excise reduction of September 2018 decreased the cigarette prices by 10%. So price of legal pack declined from 2.2 to 2 euros. If smokers used to buy smuggling cigarettes for 0.6 euro paid packs, they had no reason to switch back to legal cigarettes just because the price decreased to 2 euros. The representative of government of tobacco tax agency responded that the institution has no way to reliably and accurately determine the size of illegal cigarette store nowhere. So any claims of changes of cigarette smuggling into Montenegro or out of the country are not based on any rigorous evidence. So the volume of cigarette uh, smuggling in the first half of 2018 were substantially overstated by tobacco industry and its allies. And the decline of cigarette sales at this time was caused not by high smuggling, but by the forest telling. Next slide. And one more feature is price overshifting. The tobacco industry increased its part of the average cigarettes price. It's also called net of tax price between July 2017 and September 2018 by 15%, while the inflation was below 2% during this time. Such price overshifting increased industry profits on the declining market, but also increased the final retail price, which encouraged both the reduction of tobacco consumption and cigarette smuggling into Montenegro. Another factor of excise revenue decline was VAT increase. From January 2018, the VAT rate in Montenegro increased from 19 to 21%. It further increased cigarette prices and reduced their affordability and consumption. However, additional revenue from this tax increase was paid as VAT, but not as excise. So the excise revenue decreased in 2018 to a larger extent than if the VAT rate did not change. Next slide. So conclusion. The industry effectively responded to tax hikes in Montenegro with a set of hidden actions that temporarily reduced tobacco excise revenue and persuaded the government to reduce tobacco, uh, reduce the excise rates. The trail set of hidden actions included first, forest telling, second, cigarette smuggling overestimating, third, price overshifting. The government which plan tax hike should be aware of such industry actions and need to develop effective countermeasures. The most effective countermeasures are based on public disclosure of the tobacco industry hidden action. To make this possible, carefully monthly monitoring of tobacco economics indicators is needed, including revenue, sales, prices, import, export. And for those who has more interest in tobacco taxation, I advise to go to the World Bank page on tobacco and then find the country report. Our team published more than 20 reports on uh, different countries, including Montenegro and others. And it's full text available on the web page. Uh, so it's please download and read about details of taxation in different countries. Thank you.
Thank you, Constantine. Brilliant time. Uh, oh, just I would like to remind you again that please, if you have any questions, submit them on the chat box. Uh, the tobacco uh, epidemic uh, is on the rise in, in Jordan and they're defined as a public health emergency by the United Nations. Prevalence high, high prevalence. Uh, and also, as we saw on the maps, uh, at one of the countries where is the tobacco industry has uh, a lot of influence uh, on the uh, local uh, stakeholders and uh, governments. Uh, Ms. Mawia Al Zawawi will talk about Jordan case, Tobacco Industry Interference Index. Uh, which was updated this year, the latest one also. So Ms. Mawia uh, has Master in Business Education, uh, Human Resource, Resources, High Diploma in uh, pall uh, Palliative Care. And uh, Ms. Mawia is the uh, board member of the Framework Commission Alliance on Tobacco Control. And is, she's a form she was former director at Lena and the Green Hand Society in Jordan. Uh, she was involved in many uh, tobacco control activities since 2006, received many recognition on local, regional, and the global levels, uh, was nominated as a uh, 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 global cancer uh, control amb ambassador, also part of uh, regional NCD, or one of the founders of NCD Alliance in the region, and uh, in 2000. 11, she was awarded the regional uh, No Tobacco Day Award from World Health Organization. Uh, Ms. Mawia, please, the floor is yours. Hello, uh, hi, Dr. Hani. Thank you very much for this introduction and thank you for uh, having me in this very important session. I'm trying to share my, uh, my presentation. Can you see my presentation? Mm, not really. Okay. There's a, a green button in the middle of the left panel, share screen. Yeah, yeah, I pressed on it. If now I will run your presentation. Yeah, yeah, can you do that, please? Mm -hmm. Okay. When we talk about uh, first, when I when I I would like first to bring uh, the sorry, I'm sorry. Okay. When we talk about uh, the tobacco industry interference first, I would like to uh, shed a light on the Global Tobacco Industry Index, which is uh, a global survey that uh, show how governments are responding to tobacco industry interference and protecting their public health policies from the commercial and vested interests as required under the WHO FCTC. This global index actually uh, were produced in 2020 by the Global Center for Good Governance in Tobacco Control, GCTC and Partners. And you can see, uh, you can visit their links and view this very important uh, uh, index. Uh, the base of this index is Article 5.3 of the WHO FCTC, which is uh, the backbone, as we all know, of the treaty. Uh, the treaty cannot succeed if industry interference is not rooted out. And uh, the implementation guidelines for this article uh, were adopted in 2008 by all members parties, which is 181 countries. And uh, this guideline uh, were uh, structured to assist countries uh, with reaching legal obligations to ensure the protection of tobacco control efforts from the tobacco industry interference uh, and its activities. Uh, the, uh, the base of this uh, uh, index, uh, it's seven parts, and each part uh, discuss the level of participation 
like in policy development or in CSR activities around the country, or it shows the conflict measure, the conflict of interest, uh, or the benefits that are giving to uh, the tobacco industry. Also having unnecessary interactions between officials and the tobacco industry, plus the transparency, and the last one, uh, the preventive uh, measures. Uh, this is the uh, slide uh, from the tobacco industry interference uh, show the overall country ranking and you can see Jordan were among the countries that scored uh, very high, uh, scored like uh, 34, 31. I'm sorry for, for interrupting but you have to tell me next slide because I was waiting for a clue for you to switch. I'm sorry, the next yes. one. Yes, I'm sorry. Do you see what's yeah. on the screen? Uh, so yes. Oh, that's small, so, okay. This yeah, is the slide sorry. you're talking about. Okay. Yeah, this is the Please one. Say on. next slide from now on. Okay. Okay. This is the figure. Uh, you can see it all, and you can see Japan where uh, the most was 34 and Jordan like 31. Next, please. Next slide. Yes, this is yeah. Next, this is the index of Jordan. We did actually. We participated in two, uh, one in 2019 and one in uh, 2020. Uh, first, uh, general information about Jordan. It's uh, located in the heart of the Middle East with current population uh, 10 million plus. Uh, the country report in 2019, we scored 79 and in 2020, we scored 77. Uh, the score were uh, not that much, you know, lower, uh, but uh, due also to uh, the amount of countries that participated uh, in the uh, second reporting, the global reports, which is like uh, 57 countries. Uh, Jordan uh, tobacco use is very high, uh, according to the latest uh, uh, survey is like 65.3 men uh, who smoke traditional cigarettes with 15% uh, electronics. Uh, the women also 16.4 traditional cigarettes with electronics, uh, uh, 2.4. Uh, the daily usage of uh, four smokers average 21.1 cigarettes, which is the, the highest uh, in the world. Next, please. Okay. Uh, this slide, I'm going to give like examples of uh, uh, these the seven parts we, were, we talked about. Uh, the first one is the industry participation in policy development. Uh, in Jordan, I can give two examples. Uh, like we have the tobacco companies, they are part of the standards and meteorology organization uh, committee. Uh, this committee is responsible for standards and technical regulation of tobacco products. And this is a clear violation of Article 5.3. Another part, we have the Jordan Restaurant Association, uh, which is a front group of the tobacco industry, and they are board member with the Ministry of Tourism uh, Committee, uh, which drafted the law of inspection uh, of uh, touristic establishments, forbidding any public health for inspection without the presence of uh, GRA and the Ministry of Tourism. Uh, uh, there is still no law that limits the presence of tobacco companies and uh, exclude them while uh, regulating the tobacco products in Jordan. Uh, next slide, please. The second one, uh, we are also measured the CSR uh, activities around Jordan. Uh, in spite of the uh, evidence uh, that there is a circulated ban from the Ministry of Health to all government institutes and Prime Minister to all educational institutes uh, to ban all form of interactions with tobacco companies, uh, including accepting funds, uh, supports from the tobacco industry, in line with, the, of course, uh, the adaptation of the government to the treaty. Still, we have evidence that the tobacco companies continue to participate in uh, community CSR activities and provide their support through local charities, uh, uh, NGOs targeting youth uh, through their college funds, uh, training initiative and internship program. Uh, and even now with the COVID-19, we like documented uh, uh, um, some uh, uh, evidence that show tobacco uh, companies uh, provide and distribute uh, uh, hygiene and masks uh, to local communities. Next, please. Uh, 
the benefits that are giving the next uh, one, the next aspects we uh, explored in this uh, report, the benefits uh, that are giving to the tobacco industry in, in Jordan. Uh, Jordan, the government of Jordan, they accommodate uh, requests from the tobacco industry for a longer implementation period uh, of the law of separation, for example, uh, separation measurement in restaurant, and it's like six uh, months period, and it's, it's keep, uh, they keep extending at this period. Uh, another example I can give, uh, the postponement of banning indoor water pipe usage in restaurants and cafes, which is another problem we have. And now, luckily, with COVID-19, it's banned uh, for a while. They only ban it from indoor, and now it's like uh, outdoor. Uh, we hope that this uh, decision will continue. Uh, another recorded uh, incident in this report, there are benefits given to tobacco companies such as uh, advertisement platform and duty-free shops uh, and online platform. Uh, next, please. Form of unnecessary interaction. And this is one of the things that we found in Jordan that um, officials do not know that they are not, or they are prohibited to interact with uh, tobacco industry. And we documented, for example, one of the, uh, that involved uh, Japan Tobacco International, for example, that uh, they received the, the Environmental Stewardship Awards from the Ministry of Environment and the World Bank for its usage of direct solar uh, steam ge generation in its tobacco factory in Amman. And uh, uh, the uh, minister were there to award the uh, award for uh, the tobacco uh, company. Uh, next, please. Transparency, which is also one of the problem, I don't think only Jordan uh, suffer or, or face. I mean, most uh, countries, especially in the uh, third world countries or developing country, uh, the government uh, of Jordan and other agencies, uh, they, uh, they do not uh, disclose meetings or any form of interaction with the tobacco industry. Uh, uh, we found that there is a code of conduct for ministers uh, and governmental workers uh, that call for them to disclose any uh, at least conflict of inference or previous work with the industry. Uh, however, this does not apply uh, for the parliamentarian. Uh, next, please. Uh, the conflict of interest, uh, we did not find any evidence uh, that the government prohibits uh, contributions from the tobacco industry to, to political parties, uh, candidates or uh, campaigns, nor uh, if there is a law that prohibits government officials uh, and relatives from holding position in tobacco uh, companies. Uh, one of the uh, incidents that or the uh, um, uh, one of one head of a leading health institution, for example, husband holds a consultancy position with a tobacco company, which is uh, due to the fact that there is no structured law or existing law that prohibit that. Uh, uh, it just it happened that it's the, and uh, he's working, you know, as consultants with them. Uh, one of the major things that happened in Jordan uh, is uh, there is a trial going on uh, on a fake brand cigarettes. Uh, uh, this case began, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, the trial began last year, which is 29 formal officials and business personal persons. That's including a formal minister, minister were called for questioning at the country's state security court. Uh, they are accused of organizing, manufacturing, and importing fake brand cigarettes, which cost the government an estimated 200 million uh, in lost uh, fees and taxes. Next, please. The preventive measures. Uh, with all that said, the Minister of Health made the decision to ban all form of sponsorship uh, activities, including CSR of tobacco industry with government. Uh, this decision was shared with all government, uh, governmental agencies. Uh, the Ministry of Health also, in collaboration with the WHO, uh, they conduct several uh, awareness and policy activities, including workshop on bacterial health warning, a ban on smoking indoors, as well as initiated, uh, they initiated a draft to the new, uh, for the new uh, uh, public health uh, law. Uh, 
also to reduce the shisha consumption. Uh, there is no licensing were issue uh, to cafes and restaurants as of 2017. Uh, the Ministry of Health as well drafted the FCTC Article 5.3 guideline, which uh, have yet to be adopted. Uh, we found evidence that the government, at least the Ministry of Health, are trying very hard and we worked with them as NGOs uh, to pinpoint so many points uh, in the treaty that uh, prohibits the interference uh, of tobacco industry and uh, uh, in order, of course, to protect the, uh, the tobacco uh, control uh, uh, efforts in Jordan. And uh, as Ministry of Health, they are trying very hard, but then again, the uh, tobacco uh, control is not only uh, the Ministry of Health, uh, uh, how you say it, uh, area. It's like uh, it have to be, uh, you know, a shared work by all ministries uh, in the country and all levels in the government. Uh, next, please. Uh, the conclusion and recommendation. Uh, since the publication, as I said, we, uh, we published uh, two reports. Uh, the index saw that the level of industry interference is still high with slight improvement, 77. And of course, uh, the main causes, uh, the industry and their front group uh, influence, they, st they keep continuing and they still continue to be part of the policy making committee. Um, the lack of course of laws and regulation uh, that demand transparency by disclosing all meeting and necessary interactions between government agencies with the industry. Uh, also the high level of uh, industry CSR activities and their support in the community, especially for youth initiative, among other uh, community based projects, of course, uh, we need to find a way to eliminate uh, uh, that uh, work uh, that received from the tobacco industry and their interference. Uh, as we said, there is a certain governmental institute are prone to having more uh, interactions with the industry, uh, such as Ministry of Trade, uh, uh, Ministry of uh, Trade and Industry, Ministry of Finance, uh, Ministry of Tourism, and uh, Jordan Standard and Metrology Organization, uh, among four others. And uh, these uh, ministries, uh, they truly count the tobacco industry as a stakeholder and legit uh, investors in the country. And uh, they all, uh, they debate the, the fact that uh, uh, we should eliminate the interaction with them, sadly. Uh, this is some of the, uh, next uh, slide please. This is some of the uh, pictures. Uh, uh, the first, uh, there is a, the, where there's youth, there is like a fund, funded event by the tobacco industry. Then in the middle we have officials uh, sitting with uh, uh, front groups uh, for the tobacco industry. And the first one on the top, this is the, uh, Japan Tobacco International and one of the Mr. Opening, uh, you know, uh, uh, a branch or, you know, an activity for them. Uh, next, please. Next slide, please. This is the last slide where is the steps uh, toward preventing tobacco interference. Uh, the first thing we need to do, uh, all governments uh, need to uh, uh, find more facts and have the FCTC 5.3 as a baseline. They need to evaluate and assess, uh, which is assess and review the status quo of the country and convert it to, uh, to the, uh, you know, Article 5.3 and see uh, how they are doing. Uh, also take action and uh, that means establishing a committee with government, private sector and NGOs, with, uh, which is all involved parties so they can work together on eliminating the tobacco industry uh, interference. And uh, also uh, seeking help from the FCTC, WHO and FCA. And the last thing, which is uh, something that we do, which is uh, having the NGO assist with the shadow reporting or participating in, uh, in, uh, uh, in the global reporting. So this way, every year we know exactly where we stand and we can measure uh, the government uh, work and uh, uh, how much they are, uh, 
how much uh, work they are, uh, you know, they're doing to eliminate the uh, uh, impact of the tobacco industry. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and that's it. Thanks, Dr. Hani. greatest number of uh, lucid sales against tobacco companies. Since 2000, each of Canada, Canada's provincial governments has filled for recovery of healthcare costs. Class action uh, lawsuits uh, filled in Quebec resulted in lower court victory in 2015 and provincial appeal court victory on the 1st of March 2019 with the companies jointly ordered to pay more than $9 billion to 100,000 Quebec smokers. So lessons from Canada's 20 years lawsuit against tobacco companies. Uh, Ms. Cynthia uh, Callard will talk about that. Uh, Cynthia was a legislative aide during the development of Canada's first tobacco control laws in the, in the late uh, of 90s, of 80s, and soon afterward became executive director of Physicians for Smoke Free Canada. She has provided technical assistance to governments in Canada and was seconded to the British Columbia government during the development of, the, of its lawsuit against tobacco companies. Uh, Ms. Cynthia, I ask you to start the presentation. The floor is yours. Thank you. Can you see the slides? No. Uh, are you clicking on the share screen green button? Yes, I am, and it's on my screen that's shared, but you still can't see it? Okay, then I'll, I'll ask. There seems to be a problem with the size. Could you please run them for me? Uh, yes, of course. Thank you very much. Uh, next slide, thank you. Um, today, um, I'm very glad to be, have an opportunity to share some details about the Canadian government and private efforts to sue tobacco companies and some of the lessons we have learned along the way. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Oh, yes. Next slide, please. Is it visible now? Well, it went a couple of times through. Okay, that's okay. Uh, our, um, like our colleagues around the world, uh, tobacco control groups in Canada have, in fact, encouraged uh, governments to sue tobacco companies. We saw it as a way to achieve both public justice and to support public health efforts, to force the companies to provide compensation to injured smokers and also to governments and taxpayers who had to pay the costs of treating healthcare disease in Canada healthcare systems are paid for by the state. And we were successful. Canada has been a home to more than half of the um, large term, large scale uh, uh, tobacco lawsuits that would be uh, cost recovery and um, class actions outside of, the, outside of the United States. There are very few of these cases. Next slide. There are two types of large cases in Canada, class action suits that have been filed on behalf of smokers and uh, cost recovery suits that have been filed by all 10 of our provincial governments. Next slide, please. The first of these uh, actions, both for class actions and for provincial cost recovery were filed 20 years, over 20 years ago in 1998. This was on the heels of the successful actions in the United States and the master settlement agreement that was signed in 1998. The British Columbia government, that's our most westerly province, filed suit in 1998. So were two class actions filed in Quebec. Since then, additional class actions were filed, although none of them have progressed, and additional cost recovery suits were filed by provincial governments, although none of them have progressed. There's only been one trial, next slide please, of these cases. 
This was uh, this trial took place between 2014, uh, 12 and 2014, and was one of the longest trials and biggest trials in Canadian history. You're not allowed to take pictures in Canadian courts, but I snuck this picture from a seat where, where I sat during most of the proceedings of the Quebec trials. It was an enormously uh, challenging and complex piece of legislation, uh, litigation involving more than 42,000 exhibits, 72 witnesses, and 30 judgments that took place during the trial. Next slide, please. The outcome was a unanimous victory for public health in that six judges unanimously agreed that tobacco companies had broken the law. The, uh, this is uh, very significant that there was not a dissenting judge in this whole, in the first two reviews of the, of the trial and of the exhibits and that the uh, judges took several months and wrote several hundred pages detailing the ways in which the companies had broken Canadian law, had broken the rights, had um, severed the rights of smokers and had um, otherwise violated consumer and basic protections. Next slide, please. Issues that they found fault with companies were not only that they had failed to uh, provide information to consumers about the harms of their products, but that they had colluded to um, delay the, the implementation of regulations and that they had um, done so in a way that was um, unlawfully interfering with the right to life of smokers and which was inconsistent with the duties and obligations of manufacturers to include information under Quebec law with representations made to them. At the end of these uh, proceedings, the companies were ordered to pay 13 billion Canadian dollars, that's about 8 billion euros, to 100,000 injured Quebec smokers. Next slide, please. Normally in the Canadian proceedings, you go through three levels of court review, an initial court and then a provincial appeal court. And then finally, if, if necessary, or if, if allowed by the Supreme Court to the Supreme Court of Canada, we had expected that this case would go to the Supreme Court, which would decide in one of two ways. Either it would decide that it didn't want to hear the case, that it was satisfied that the issue had been dealt with and that there was no need for them to uh, look further or that they would hold their own hearing into it. But because the, um, of the unanimity and the strength of the rulings from the lower courts, immediately after the lower court, it became clear that the tobacco companies were unlikely to win in Supreme Court. But they didn't write any checks and they didn't settle any of the cases with um, provincial governments. Instead, next slide please. Instead, they went to a court in Ontario and sought insolvency protection. What this did was to put a halt on all litigation across Canada and require the companies to operate their business as usual while they went into discussions with all of the people that, to whom they owed money. That included the 10 provincial governments, the injured Quebec smokers, the uh, members, the smokers that were potential members of other class actions. This happened in March of 2019, so a year, more than a year and a half ago. And since then, the whole process has been absolutely sealed in, in, uh, in um, behind secret walls. And the, a mediator has been appointed to uh, uh, engage in discussions with governments. Next slide, please. In retrospect, it perhaps shouldn't have been a surprise that the tobacco industry shifted the field away from the courts and into, an, into a business setting. Um, but at, during the whole of the 20 years that were leading up to this uh, case and these events, none of us properly anticipated what they could do and how to um, uh, arrange for it. And so there were a number of failures on our part to actually properly plan for the trial. We never set objectives for the resolution of the suits that could be formed part and parcel of what negotiations went on. The provincial legislators never really paid much attention to the suits. The media never really properly followed it. We had very little coverage despite our efforts. The federal government, which is not a member of any of the discussions, but is responsible for the overall health of Canada, never uh, uh, engaged in these proceedings to ensure the public health interest, never uh, worked to ensure that there was Article 5.3 transparency provisions or any um, meaningful assurance that public health would be um, considered. The larger health uh, community has essentially remained detached from the proceedings. Generally speaking, we were caught unawares. Next slide, please. 
But we've had to sort of put our head around some of the hard realities. The litigation was kind of framed around money. The um, provincial governments collectively asked for 500 billion Canadian dollars. That they estimated was the cost to the taxpayer for over for several decades of treating tobacco caused disease. But it's very it would be very difficult for um, Canadian governments to receive even a small proportion of that amount. There's not really enough money available to tobacco companies to pay. They have had to save some money over the last few years as a result of the court cases, but previously to that, they sent their money overseas and that money was in turn distributed to shareholders. There's no bank account with lots of money to uh, attach. The Canadian tobacco companies earn about two billion Canadian dollars a year and the multinational companies earn about 30 billion dollars a year. Essentially there's not anywhere near enough money to, to recompensate or to compensate Canadian governments or smokers for the injuries that have been done to them. Next slide please. But there's another challenge for us as we realize that there's a financial settlement that's around money is that any money that can be generated to pay compensation to provincial governments or pay compensation even to smokers is going to have to be extracted from future sales. So in a sense, this is almost like the Ponzi scheme where they have to go and hurt additional people in order to pay compensation to people that they hurt in the past. Another complication for Canada is that if money is paid from the uh, multinational companies, there'll be a requirement for those companies to generate revenues offshore. And this could end up in a situation where smokers in developing countries are um, being exploited in order to recompensate um, governments in Canada. Next slide, please. So here we are after 20 years of litigation, uh, the tobacco industry has yet to pay a single dollar to compensate the uh, victims. And nor have they changed their behavior. In fact, they're replicating with their sale of e-cigarettes exactly the behavior that they exhibited during the 1960s, 70s, and 80s in the way they sold cigarettes in Canada. They don't include any meaningful warnings. They're working to avoid regulations. They're working together to kind of create um, a false sense of security around these products. And it seems that the provincial governments have been outmaneuvered by the industry in that the, um, they're proactive um, aggression and lawsuits against the industry has forced them into a position where it's now the governments that are in a defensive position trying to respond to the actions and decisions of the industry. But from a public health perspective, the most uh, challenging and concerning thing is that the whole future of the tobacco business in Canada is being negotiated in secret with the provincial governments and the industry without the federal government, without any uh, input from uh, the public, from health experts or even uh, from the public health community and without any transparency for us to even know what's going on. Next slide, please. So uh, a number of us are looking at ways to try and unravel this problem and um, we are proposing that the provinces should in fact shift the footing again, that they should perhaps abandon the insolvency protection and use the power they have collectively to dissolve that process but also that they should be looking more for health outcomes to resolve these uh, lawsuits and to um, abandon any expectation of having a meaningful amount of money involved in the case. Importantly, that the provinces should set a requirement that the settlement or the resolution of these suits does not cause any future injury to, uh, to smokers, that um, it doesn't involve the perpetuation of the industry or the continuation of smoking or the continuation of tobacco sales, and that the federal government should ensure that uh, Article 5.3 is respected in this process and that uh, transparency is um, uh, imposed on any settlement process. Uh, next slide, please. So for countries that are looking to uh, use Article 19 or lawsuits to advance tobacco control, I think that Canada has shown a number of um, uh, lessons that uh, should guide decision making. One is that um, it's a long process and you have to have long term and short term work plan and objectives and uh, to find a way to sustain interest and involvement. Governments, we've had several changes of governments in all provincial governments since the lawsuits were filed. New governments don't necessarily share the priorities and concerns and perspectives of previous governments and the lawsuits have suffered from that. 
um, that uh, health ministries should be the ones who are guiding this process, not finance ministries, that there has to be a mechanism to protect against interference, that you have to avoid contingency fee, fee arrangements. These are um, contracts with lawyers where lawyers are paid a percentage of any resolution. These, um, uh, these arrangements necessarily incentivize the system to look for a monetary reward and not a health reward. A lawyer can't get a percentage of a better health outcome in the same way. And there has to be better strategic planning, um, a game plan to counter the tobacco industry tactics or the maneuvers that they might have to undermine a litigation effort. But from a tobacco control policy perspective with how we should manage litigation within the context of FCTC implementation or our own domestic tobacco control measures, it's clear that litigation has to be kind of embedded within a tobacco control and has to serve tobacco control outcomes. It can't be a sort of an, uh, um, an ancillary activity or a parallel activity. It has to be, in fact, integrated into health uh, goals. And uh, that litigation has to be embedded, because of that, litigation has to be embedded in a process that ensures that um, there are no uh, additional uh, uh, injury to smokers and that uh, smoking is neither supported or perpetuated more than it would be from that, uh, from any resolution of the suits. Next slide, please. Uh, we maintain a website that gives updates, regular updates on the trial developments in Canada. If you're interested in this issue, please either email me or follow us at um, the um, on our blog, trial blog. That's tobaccotrial.blogspot.com. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cynthia. Uh, as we know also that World Health Organization recommends banning menthol cigarettes because of a menthol's role in the initiation and continuance of smoking across the world. The tobacco industry has attempted to block the limit or uh, circumvent legislation aimed at restriction uh, menthol sales. Uh, each 10 cigarettes, we have one of them in the world globally, we have one of them uh, uh, mentor uh, cigarette. Uh, Miss Karen uh, Silver will talk about tobacco industry tactics in circumvent and undermine the tobacco product directive mentor ban in the UK. Miss Karen, a uh, researcher with tobacco tactics team and the Tobacco Control Research Group at the University of Bath, which is a partner in STOP uh, initiative, the Global Tobacco Industry Watchdog. We all see the reports and all wonderful work that uh, they do. Uh, so while uh, Ms. Karen work for Tobacco Taxes covers a wide range of topics uh, particular focus is on tobacco company product uh, uh, innovations, uh, including next generation products and related tobacco lobbying and interference. So, Ms. Karen, uh, the floor is yours, please. Okay, I'm not optimistic, but I will attempt to share my screen. Are you able to see my screen? Yes. Yes. Ah. <laughs> Success. I'll just try and uh, run the slideshow. There we go. You able to see that? Okay. Um, so I'd just like to start by stressing that um, the work that I'm presenting today um, is an overview of a team um, effort on the part of Tobacco Tactics uh, team at Bath and the Tobacco Control Research Group and external partners, including Ash. So I'm presenting an overview of what we did, why we did it and how and what we found. Um, I'm very happy to take questions, obviously, but I may need to pass you on to colleagues if the, the questions are on the more technical side or outside of the scope of what I'm, I'm presenting today. So. Um, Let's see if I can move on. So first I'll start just with a bit of general background, uh, then talk about what we did in terms of monitoring investigation, um, the analysis that we performed, and then some recommendations um, and some links at the end. So first of all, the background. Um, it's important to understand the significance of menthol to the tobacco industry. So we'll start just with a few facts and figures. Um, so menthol makes is believed to make smoking more palatable. It may help establish uh, smoking among young people and reduce the likelihood of quitting. 
the WHO estimate that uh, the global market of menthol is around 10% of the total cigarette market. And we know that the tobacco industry has interfered in, in menthol regulation and flavor bans in um, a number of countries, including Brazil, Chile, China, uh, sorry, Canada, the United States, and of course the EU and Moldova more recently. Um, so um, the EU TPD regulations uh, refer to characterizing flavor and these were transposed into UK law in 2016 and came into force in May, 2020. And there had already been an additional three year phase out period or sell through period for menthol cigarettes. So the industry had some considerable time to prepare for this ban. Um, so um, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not going to uh, go into detail on the effects of menthol, the reasons for the ban, the original delay or activity in other parts of the world. I'm just focusing on the UK. But if you would like to read more about those, please do look at our tobacco tactics page, which goes into those areas in more detail. So um, if we look at the prevalence data across the EU, there's a clear uh, evidence of why the tobacco industry is keen to fight for, was keen to fight for a delay in the first place. Um, as you can see, according to the uh, 2016 ITC survey, uh, there were high levels of menthol consumption in some uh, European countries and England, uh, not, note it's not the UK here, it's, it's England, uh, was at the top of that scale, closely followed by Poland and Romania. Uh, this combines menthol and other flavoured, but since uh, the um, ban, uh, the initial uh, banning of other flavoured cigarettes in Britain, in UK, it's uh, only been menthol that's been available. So uh, if we look at the uh, whole menthol and capsule market uh, across Europe, noting this is uh, menthol flavoured tobacco uh, cigarettes and also those using um, user activated capsules. This is based on Euromonitor data from 2018, but it shows that the total uh, market in the UK was around 21% uh, of menthol versus other cigarettes and tobacco products. So from that, we've estimated that that means around 900,000 UK smokers uh, usually smoke menthol cigarettes and considerably more up to around 1.3 million smoking them um, some of the time. Um, so we can see the problem illustrated quite clearly here that after the uh, the TPD and the ban was uh, introduced, um, the share of menthol in the UK market continued to grow from 14% in 2014 up to about 21% in 2018. And during that time, the tobacco industry introduced new menthol cigarette varieties. It advertised their products to retailers. Um, it, it, it put in place some buyback schemes uh, to encourage retailers to keep stocking menthol right up until the time of the ban. And retailers and smokers weren't informed until very, very late. So within uh, four or five months um, of the ban coming into force. And it appears that the tobacco industry had done nothing in that time to reduce any of its existing products in this supposed sell through period. And at the same time, they were also developing new products to help them circumvent, undermine or otherwise exploit the ban. And if we take a look at this market share diagram, we see that the, the key players in this are uh, Imperial Tobacco and Japan Tobacco International, with uh, BAT and Philip Morris having a, a much smaller share of the menthol market. So I'm going to focus on those two companies in the slides that follow. So what did we do? Um, we were aware of the um, impending menthol ban, but we could see very little public activity on the part of tobacco companies. And uh, it was not at all clear from um, tobacco company documents or presentations what, what they were planning. Um, there were mentions of the, of the menthol ban, but, but not a great deal more. But what we do is we monitor the uh, retail press, uh, industry publications and retail publications in the UK. And in late uh, 2019, early 2020, we began picking up various stories on new menthol products. So this is around four to five months uh, before the ban, although some companies didn't appear to be made doing anything until about three months before. Clearly, this is uh, they had been planning this for some time, but this was the first sign that we had of, of what they were actually doing. So we looked into these stories and, uh, and the products in detail. And this is what we found. Um, so focusing first on the products. Uh, so Imperial Tobacco, uh, the first product that we noticed was these uh, menthol infused cards uh, that are designed to be inserted into cigarette packs. 
and uh, they had already introduced menthol filters for roll your own but uh, these were developed and new varieties of menthol and non-menthol uh, filters that were called things like green and bright began to appear. Um, accessories are not included in the ban so if they're sold separately uh, that's perfectly legal as, it, as, as the law stands in the UK. Um, so that's Imperial Tobacco or Imperial Brands. Um, Japan Tobacco International uh, bought out uh, new ranges of cigarettes with what they called distinctive blends. Um, and there were some reports that these still tasted and smelled of menthol. Although J uh, Japan Tobacco International deny that they contain menthol, uh, they have been publicly accused by British American Tobacco, um, who have actually uh, instigated their own laboratory testing to, to, to attempt to prove this. Um, but most significantly, uh, JTI launched a cigarillo, which is essentially a cigarette wrapped in tobacco leaf with a uh, menthol capsule. And this was a way for them to um, bypass the menthol ban. Um, it was also a, a way for them to effectively bypass standardized packaging rules, which don't currently, currently apply to cigarillos. Uh, there are no minimum pack sizes and they could sell them at around half the price uh, in 10 packs at around half the price of uh, standard cigarettes. And they also uh, have a lower tax rate. So we, we, we actually wrote a, a specific paper on those cigarillos, um, which I'll share a link at the end. Uh, that was led by our tax expert, Dr. Rob Branston. Um, British American Tobacco and Philip Morris, much smaller market share. Uh, BAT used it as an opportunity to promote their e-cigarettes, but they did also bring out various uh, new ranges, uh, which they say have no menthol. They do seem to be mainly about new filters rather than new tobacco blends, but it's not entirely clear uh, what exactly each of those constitutes, but BAT say that they, they have complied fully with the rules. Uh, but they did uh, do their own surveys around uh, claiming no consumer awareness of the menthol ban, not surprisingly, given that they hadn't really shared any information up until that point. Uh, Philip Morris, um, also a much smaller market share, and not surprisingly, they use this as an opportunity to promote uh, ICOS to retailers and the public. And uh, with a very, for all their smoke-free rhetoric, there were very, very little uh, encouragement for people to quit. And if you're wondering what this tiny writing is at the bottom, that is actually from the uh, Philip Morris um, ICOS uh, menthol ban website with a tiny link to NHS Smoke Free at the bottom corner there. So, um, and since uh, possibly on the back of uh, the success of JTI and getting its products onto the market, um, Imperial Tobacco seem to have followed suit and they have also brought out um, some uh, Cigarillo products which are even uh, cheaper than Japan Tobaccos. Um, and this uh, is in the middle of the pandemic. This product was launched in August. Um, and in October, we, we saw that they were also bringing out new crush ball uh, filters uh, with a cooling sensation. Again, um, not apparently menthol, but it, it is hard to tell. Um, so just to summarize, so the, the, the individual tactics varied across the companies. So the broad strategies that we identified uh, were product innovation, so new filters, new pack inserts, uh, brand diversification, so new blends under the existing brand names, um, modifying products that fall into other tobacco categories, namely the cigarillos, and also promoting uh, alternative products um, rather than quitting. Um, but the main thing I think that we found that, that, that um, prolonged inaction from the tobacco company. So several years of not doing anything at all, and then at the last minute, increasing the pressure on retailers. Um, there's a few headlines from some of the publications that we picked up at the time. Uh, so the industry classic tactics, old arguments, asking for more time, although they'd had several years, reporting chaos and confusion, which somehow was no responsibility of the tobacco industry. Um, there were month menthol buyback schemes, but they were slightly random and retailers were saying that they had very little information. They didn't know what to do with any stock that they had left over at the, at the time of the ban. And um, slightly bizarrely, uh, Japan Tobacco claiming that fake menthol products were being seized, although we, we didn't manage to find any evidence of that and nor did trading standards. So that was a bit of a strange one. Um, and we have seen no evidence of fakes or illicits uh, on the market, although you would have to assume that that, that was probably unlikely that uh, their buyback schemes um, didn't really help to mitigate that risk. 
So in terms of our recommendations um, for regulation and taxation, this, these are the recommendations that, that Bath are putting forward. It's that all, uh, in, we should be including all tobacco products and accessories in regulations, uh, all pack types, all flavours. Ban menthol itself as an ingredient, not easy, but uh, this um, characterising flavour definition is problematic and we shouldn't just be trying to ban products where, which have menthol at observable levels, given that they do seem to be introducing menthol at very low levels, which is still uh, arguably detectable. But the main um, recommendation is that there shouldn't be any derogations, phase-ins or sell-through periods to maximise the impact of this kind of regulation and stop the sales of products which are being banned as quickly as possible, because the tobacco industry is just taking advantage of that. Um, and then more specifically, tax uh, rates should be aligned. So cigarillos shouldn't be having preferential taxation rates to regular cigarettes. Um, you can read more um, about the specifics of what we found and, and these recommendations on our tobacco tactics page. And we have two papers, one uh, industry watch piece, um, which describes uh, the, these tactics uh, in general, and then a more specific pa paper about the taxation, which has all the details about the cigarettes and uh, how they've got away with this. Um, and just some recommendations for further research and monitoring. Um, many of these we are doing to a greater or lesser extent. So look, monitoring the activity since the ban in, in the UK. And as, as much as we can tell, we've got Brexit on the way and things are very unclear with the uh, demise of Public Health England as well. So we're, we're looking to see what's gonna change if anything there. Um, we are also picking up some evidence from other European countries um, and we're monitoring, uh, we will be monitoring interference around uh, the TPD re revision specifically in respect of menthol. Um, and one of, our, one of our aims is to move into looking at uh, industry interests and activities in lower middle income countries, uh, again, specifically around menthol and other tobacco flavours. So um, that's what we're doing. And if you'd like to get in touch, uh, I'll share our contact information, uh, which can be distributed um, after the event. So I look forward to receiving any questions from you. Thank you for having me here and uh, I'll stop sharing now. Thank you very much. We have a few questions to uh, our panelists. So first one uh, directly to Ms. Mawia, what is the methodology of Jordan survey? This question was asked by Dr. Jawad. So please, Ms. Mawia. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, I'm sorry, I tried to type in the chat box, but for some reason it's not going through. Uh, actually, if it's for the numbers of uh, the tobacco usage, it's, uh, it was uh, collected from the step survey. Uh, as for the index, it was like a survey, uh, it's like a form, uh, the index, which is a unified form uh, filled by uh, all uh, the people who, you know, uh, participated, like all the countries, the same, you know, same survey. And uh, we collected the data uh, or uh, each survey have like questions, detailed questions, and uh, you get the answer and you get a ranking based on the answers. Uh, the data were collected to fill out these forms. They were uh, from reviewing the law, uh, from uh, uh, numbers from the WHO, uh, you know, the exist numbers. Uh, also interviews with the, some of the decision makers while we, uh, you know, uh, doing uh, uh, the surveys. Uh, the collecting information from the media as well uh, because uh, this is one of the challenges actually or the setbacks that we have that uh, uh, and that's true of course the lack of uh, uh, as we said transparency that there is uh, a very challenging to obtain the information because there is no disclosure of uh, you know uh, meetings between the tobacco industry and the officials uh, so it was a very challenging job, I think, I'm assuming not only in Jordan, every country is, uh, but we had uh, meetings with the uh, Ministry of Health, uh, which is uh, count, uh, the, the people who's in charge uh, uh, in Jordan, and uh, we validate most of the points uh, while uh, we, uh, we were doing the index. Uh, it was done twice. Oh, okay, that's, it. that's another question. Thank you. Hope this answered the question. Thank you, thank you, Molly. Okay, the uh, second questions, uh, question, it's um, uh, from Dr. Jawad also about uh, loose, loose suit cases in Canada. So uh, one of them already answered in the chat box. Thank you, Cynthia. The other one, would you get the money by 2021? 
Um, I, I don't think that there'll be money. It, 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 anything's possible. I have no way of knowing. But um, what we're hoping is, in fact, that although Quebec smokers, we are hoping that Quebec smokers who are injured will receive some compensation, but we're not particularly anxious that governments get money. For us, the big question is, are we going to get a realignment of this tobacco litigation towards health objectives in 2021? And that's a very a key concern for us, but there's no indication really at this point of how it's going. Thank you, Cynthia. Okay, the second question uh, to all NGOs from uh, Dr. Fatima. Thank you, Dr. Fatima, being with us. Dr. Fatima is the TFI Regional Advisor in Euro Region. So the question is uh, for all NGOs who are conducting the index, how is the dissemination going on? And are they sure it reached decision makers at the same time? So uh, from opinion of Dr. Fatim, that this uh, should not be a one-time activity, which I agree also on that. It has to be repeated and updated. updated. Uh, so uh, uh, for monitoring developments and other uh, reasons. So um, please, so the, about the dissemination, if any idea. Okay, so any suggestions on this uh, questions? Because we have here, and I'm not sure if we have other countries or other NGOs who already conducted the, the index, uh, but I can uh, talk about uh, Emro region. Uh, there is uh, four countries already conducted the, the, the index, and I believe it should be disseminated uh, to all stakeholders officially and uh, should be published also and updated yearly on yearly basis. Uh, in addition to that, um, launching of the report also as it was in Jordan, in Egypt. So, uh, so it's very essential. Yes, Maui, if you have any uh, contribution to this question. Unmute yourself, please. Okay, first I would like to say hi to Dr. Fatma. It's an honor having her, uh, you know, with us. And uh, uh, I totally agree with her and you thought, of course, and in Jordan we did it like twice. And yes, uh, it's very important to do it on annually, like every year. And I, I believe this end is gonna be performed every year uh, from what I understood uh, uh, from Mary, because uh, uh, it's very important to catch up and, uh, and uh, compare, have a comparative, uh, you know, uh, uh, status uh, between years. Uh, in, in terms of uh, decision makers, actually what we did the first uh, uh, round we, we had more success in launching and disseminating the information among all decision maker levels and having meetings with uh, higher authorities and even conducting meetings you know with ministers uh, and uh, handing in the reports uh, this time around it was a very uh, you know shy uh, you know launching because of the COVID uh, the epidemic it's taken a toll in Jordan and uh, most of uh, the resources and even the work director toward the epidemic but that does not mean that we don't uh, distribute, uh, we, uh, we distribute the uh, reports, uh, hard copy to all ministers uh, and the uh, ministry, uh, uh, you know, involved and uh, hopefully uh, in a few months uh, things will get much better and we'll go back on, on you know, on, uh, on track and uh, have more work uh, and uh, collaboration between the governments, uh, different ministries and the NGOs. Thank you. Thank you, Mario. Um, okay, if there is no more contribution in this. Uh, we have the other question uh, is, I believe, uh, FCA, uh, Maria, and uh, uh, Karen also uh, will answer this. How are you continuing to support NGOs' work in monitoring the industry and expose their tactics? 
And does the STOP initiative give support to NGOs in this regard? Um, sorry, would you like me to respond to that one? Yes, please, you can start, of course. Yeah. Um, so, um, yes, obviously, we, we, we hope that the um, Tobacco Tactics website in itself provides some support to people in terms of um, information, and we're always very willing to um you know if people have an inquiry about a specific piece of information they can't easily find we we're very happy to to help find that either on our in our own material or perhaps elsewhere or, or connect people for the information that they need um, but there is a specific initiative within the stop uh, partnership uh, for people to get in touch uh, to request uh, specific support to counter in industry interference in the country and we call this a react process so um, if you if you would like to know more about that I encourage you to visit the the stop website um, and the tobacco tactics website which also which also connects to that um, or, or get in touch and, and when we can give you more information about that we also running um, training courses um, on tobacco industry monitoring and interference so that's another thing that um, that we can discuss and um, I have colleagues I, I know on this call that might be able to give some some more specific information about how we can help but um, I think a lot of that uh, is available on our website but please yes do just get in touch if, if you have um, specific needs that you'd like to talk about. Thank you Karen. Maria, you have any contribution to this? Thank you Hani, uh, I think it's the same like when um, we, uh, what we do usually is uh, all the countries that participated, you know, uh, we uh, just to follow up with them and uh, we are willing to provide technical uh, support as well for the time being. And if there is any needed help, they can reach out for us and we can work with them uh, on uh, answering any questions and on do follow ups with even the, uh, in the process of reporting and uh, uh, the final, uh, you know, uh, uh, the final uh, edition uh, for the reporting. Uh, we are looking for uh, more participation from our region because there's not so many countries uh, participated. Hopefully by next year we'll get more you know, from the region and other regions. Okay. So we can have that as to compare not mm. only within uh, the region but also with other uh, regions as well. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Okay, we have the next question. So, uh, is, does current law in UK allows for the other mental products that are used with tobacco? Yeah, so as the law stands, yes, it allows for cigarillos uh, to be mentholated um, and it also allows for roll your own tobacco, although what we've seen is is the use of these inserts and filter tips rather than actual uh, mentho roll your own tobacco leaf. Uh, but, you know, <laughs> we wait and see. <laughs> Maybe it's going to be a long next. Um, but, um, yeah, I think I, I, just to answer, I, I saw another question around the TPD regulations and, and as things stand with Brexit, um, the current uh, regulations are all transposed into UK law and we've been led to believe that, that that won't change. But obviously, you know, it's a political decision beyond Brexit in terms of, uh, you know, whether any of those regulations uh, do get rolled back or, 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 or what's adopted in the future. Um, and we do know from the industry interference index that the tobacco industry influence in the UK is on the increase again. Uh, so that is that is a concern for us. Thank you. Thank you, Santiago. Okay. Uh, last question. I think this will be from uh, from my side. So this is regarding the lawsuit uh, cases against tobacco industry. Do you think the fed lawsuit against tobacco industry needs government support to win them, or just the fair justice will be enough? Can you understand the question? I don't understand the meaning. Um, can you rephrase, please? Okay, so uh, 
in some countries because the tobacco industry interference is in a high level. So uh, raising or filling su such a uh, lawsuit cases against tobacco industry is impossible. Even if it will be possible, so the, the result uh, will be not positive from our point of view as the tobacco control community. So do you think the government support, governmental support, uh, will push uh, these loose suit cases to win, or uh, it's not necessary? Yeah, if, I may not entirely understand the question, but I think that you're getting at the real complexities is, do you need a lawsuit to actually get health objectives? And when, when does a lawsuit work or not? The Norway, the Norwegian, either government or NGOs, I can't remember which, published a review about a decade ago looking at whether or not litigation was suitable there. And they came, I think, more or less to the conclusion that the legislature has, has a role. If they want to change the structure of the industry, it might make more sense to do it through legislative means. Perhaps it's country specific. In the United States, it was felt that the lawsuits helped achieve things that they couldn't get through their legislative officials. In other countries, it could be that legislatures are the best way. In some cases, it might be a mixture that you use the courts to, to weaken the, the, the um, position of the industry. I think the, the most important thing is to have a long-term plan for the structure and the, the a continuation of the industry and how we supply tobacco products to people. And I think that the um, absence of that plan, either in the FCTC or in the Canadian context, has hindered the ability to use litigation to establish kind of a long-term, sustainable, better platform. Uh, but I, I think with respect to how to do it, it's very probably very country-specific. Thank you very much. Because we had in the past uh, some uh, cases and, and some countries were failed because of the non-government support. <laughs> okay, so we are coming to the end of today's, but before we, we finish the, today's uh, webinar, I would like to just mention something about the, the industry again tactics on uh, on uh, novel tobacco products. So the industry lobbied for acceptance, promotion of alternative tobacco products. So Philip Morris International uh, aggressively lobbied for the promotion and sale of its heated tobacco products, which we all know Ecos is the most popular in the world and is very uh, strongly uh, promoted in all countries in the world and we see it has very big acceptance by youth and other age categories. Uh, uh, European Network uh, also as a part of uh, its conference, uh, the online edition, will hold tomorrow uh, by my colleague uh, Paulina uh, webinar on, on uh, novel tobacco products. So um, I encourage you to, uh, to participate uh, tomorrow and uh, all information on NCP website. Thank you very much. Thank you for our respected speakers, for all our colleagues from uh, all the countries who participated in today's webinar and hope we will see you soon with one of our other uh, webinars. Thank you very much and have nice day, evening, whatever, and see you later.